from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Hello, Sarah. Well, here we are, Buzzy. We are in the throes <laughs> of the Tournament of Champions. Of course, the Honors Awards went up on YouTube last Thursday evening. It was a pleasure sharing the yeah. what normally would be the blue carpet, <laughs> but ended up being the Alex Trebek stage due yeah. to a lot of rain that was a coming down rain, that evening. It was great to relive that night. It, you know, we, we had some great conversations, and the award ceremony was just really special. Yes, it really was. So if you haven't checked it out, it is up on YouTube. You get to see all the interviews before the show, and then you get to watch Ken Jennings hosting the Jeopardy! Honors, the second annual Jeopardy! Honors, and giving away some really exciting awards that we shared last week. And as we are in the throes of TOC, <laughs> our social team last week put up a hilarious little behind-the-scenes yeah. video of some of our TOC contestants, you know, preparing to take the stage. You had Chris looking through a closet full of blue shirts. <laughs> Ray kind of playing off the fact that we know he has an identical twin brother. Yes. And, hey, they haven't caught on yet as if he switched places with his twin. We had Juveria making post-its to herself. Don't be weird around Ray. Yeah. Ben Chan raised the roof. They have yep. him with some weights. Hannah doing crossword puzzles. If you haven't seen it, check that out. It's on fun. our social channels. And, you know, I think everyone is just in... TOC mania right now. It's really it. fun to see it all. And of course, like last year, our social and digital team has created those digital baseball cards for each of our 27 TOCers. So you can check those out on our website and check out how everyone's stats are matching up because they're pretty impressive. And believe it or not, right now we are taping the Jeopardy yes. Invitational Tournament. You're hearing it here first. The last tournament <laughs> of season 40. Right after this, we're getting into regular shows. We've already been booking contestants nice. for our tape days in March. So for those of you who have been asking, it's happening. And I'm sure some of you who are listening have been getting the call because we are booking people who are in the pool. And if you're not in the pool, well, you better take that anytime test. It takes 10 to 15 minutes. And we are looking for great new contestants to be our next great TOC competitors or our next great Jeopardy Invitational Tournament competitors. This is a field of 27. These are some of the best players from all time on Jeopardy. Yeah. And, you know, today's our first day where we're kicking off taping. So I'm just really excited to see some of these folks back on the Alex Trebek stage competing. You know, some of them haven't competed in over a decade. Yeah. Some in recent years. We did make a specific cutoff for this okay. Jeopardy Invitational Tournament. We we decided anyone who had competed in the 2022 Tournament of Champions like that season, that we were going to take qualifiers from before then because all of them were in fact able to qualify for Masters. Right. Those who played before 2022, Masters didn't exist. So we right. felt that was really the pool of contestants who we would reach out to for JIT. Of course, we only have 27 spots, so there are more great champions than we can invite this year, but we are intending that this will be an annual event and we'll get to continue to welcome back some of the Jeopardy greats. I can't wait. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be in the audience, but also just I'm a fan. I'm so yes. such a fan of all, so many of these people. It's going to be good. And of course, we would have had Buzzy Cohen back, <laughs> but he can't compete anymore. We've decided, at least for now, because yeah. you are certainly on many people's JIT lists, I will say. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, if that's you check sweet it of them. Out, they always say, Buzzy Cohen, if he's allowed to compete. Yes. So you know you're on our list, Buzzy. Yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to be doing my part as part of the Jepperverse. Well, Buzzy, just last week we saw our final Champions wildcard come to an end. Deb Bilodeau being crowned our champion and clinching that final 27th spot in the Tournament of Champions, which kicked off on Friday with an exciting quarterfinal matchup, our first of nine with previous Champions wildcard winner Emily Sands, six-game winner Suresh Krishnan, and four-game champion Matthew Marcus we're looking forward to highlighting last week's full week of games. And later in the pod, we'll be joined by Deb talking about their big Champions wildcard win and how they have prepared for the very quick turnaround into the mm -hmm. Tournament of Champions. But right now, we're going to take a look back at this week in Jeopardy! history. Mackenzie Jones, were you able to come up with the correct response? What is satellite? Interesting spelling. 
I noticed when you were writing, you wrote down SAT, and then you paused and wrote L-I-T-E, trying to figure out which vowel to put in between. Yeah. Yeah, you put the wrong one. <laughs> but your response is correct. So, you won't add any money at all. You'll wind up picking up 20600 and now you have an eight-day total of $204,808. All right, way to go. It was on this very day back in 2020 when Mackenzie Jones secured her eighth win, earning over $200,000. After putting on a pretty dominant performance, she secured a runaway win, and she was also the only player correct in Final Jeopardy. I like to consider that the exclamation point on the win. Her run did end the following day, however, after being defeated by Aaron Getch. So Mackenzie left us as an eight-game champion and then returned the following year for the 2021 Tournament of Champions, Little fun fact, Mackenzie's brother, John Lance, was a contestant on the show during season 36. He went up against Jason Zuffrenary and unfortunately was not able to pull out a win against a 19-game champion. But he did, however, appear on The Chase, mm -hmm. where his team defeated none other <laughs> than Chaser Buzzy Cohen. Oh, goodness me. Don't yeah, you well, love this little walk down memory lane? I did. And I, you know, it's, I knew that John had been on Jeopardy. I, I knew that he, he said his sister was in the Tournament of Champions that I hosted, although I did not know who it was when we taped because I didn't know who, who this person was. But I didn't realize that he lost to Jason, who was also in that Tournament of Champions with Mackenzie. Yeah. I didn't put that whole web together. Well, it's a tangled web here at Jeopardy. I'm trying to deflect from the fact that his team <laughs> beat me on the chase. If anyone. All right. All right. Well, we're moving on. Let's just move on. We kicked off the week with our second Champions wildcard semifinal matchup between Deandra D'Alessio, Deb Bilodeau, and Taylor Claggett. What a great game this was. Deb and Deandra neck and neck with multiple lead changes throughout the game. They each found and responded correctly to daily doubles in double jeopardy. But it was Deb who took a narrow lead heading into final. Then all three players were correct. So Deb's big wager helped them secure the win. I want to shout out, you know, we don't do this that much anymore, but I do want to shout out the fashion. Deandra in that bright pink top and Deb with the black on black, like a leather blazer, kind of loving that. Taylor in his classic clean cut. It was a real, like, I feel like I'm on three different shows right now and I'm loving it. Taylor also sporting a pocket square yeah. and a pin in honor of his niece. Moving on to Tuesday's game with Kat Jepsen, Alex Gordon, and Jesse Matheny. Alex got off to a strong start running the 13 colonies category, but Kat was able to take the lead heading into double jeopardy. Jesse then found both daily doubles in double jeopardy. He goes all in on both to add $8,800 to his score, jumping him to a commanding lead. Alex did manage to work his way back into contention before final, but it was Jesse who was the only player to come up with the correct response, and he secures the last spot in the finals. I have to bring up, we haven't talked about it in a bit, the running of the category. Mm. We'll have to bring that back up to Michael because at one point we were talking about giving some sort of bonus that wouldn't impact your score in the game, but that you would get a bonus amount, you know, as a result of your keen knowledge in a specific category. I think this is an opportunity for a sponsor situation. You think? Yeah, okay. I know it's been a while, but maybe you run the category, you get a trip to Club Med. Oh, I see. <laughs> You know, there's nothing a Jeopardy champion wants more than a trip to Club Med. I'm just saying, you know, like in the old, you know, in the old days, there were the furnished gifts. Yes, I hear you. Sarah does not like this idea, but this is what makes the pod so good. She doesn't know what I'm going to come out with. I never know. You never know. I but I think it could be, know. you know, cash is king, obviously. It's super fun. But cash it could be, king. it could be really silly to get, you know, a set of encyclopedias. Hey, Martha Bath got Martha, those it worked for Martha the 60s. Bath. If it worked for Martha, it could work for us. Well, I want to also point out Jesse got a clue about the Hansel culture. In a model walk-off in Zoolander, this actor as Hansel defeats Ben Stiller by doing something indescribable with his underwear. Jesse does a great Owen Wilson. Can you do an Owen Wilson? Wow, who is who is Owen, Owen Wilson? Ah, yes, very good. And Ken thought it was pretty solid as well. I think you're right up there. Online, someone said, you know what? Jesse saw the opportunity, and by God, he took it. You got to take the opportunity. You love those moments I when they them. just kind of they land right in your lap, and you got to do it. Yeah. And during the break, Ken was actually telling the crowd how much he liked the Hansel culture <laughs> category, and so he actually shouted out writer Marcus Brown, whose parents were in the audience on that day. 
I can't even imagine as a parent to one of yeah. the Jeopardy writers when you're in the audience and one of your children's categories plays so well and it gets a shout out from Ken. Like that's got to be a great proud parent moment. Yeah, and Marcus is one of the newer he writers. Is. He is one of our newer writers. He was just promoted last year from yeah. researcher to writer and he's been adding some really great material to the yeah. game. I, I often will look down and it's indeed a Marcus Brown category. Good for him. Another great category uh, describing the song that Marcus Brown did recently. And you never realize how tricky it is to get someone to a response of what a song was. And he had everything from Thriller to Hotline Bling to Piano Man to Just a Friend to yeah. Regulate. <laughs> um, I think that was a couple weeks ago. But really love seeing some of the great material that Marcus Brown is adding to the game board. Deb, Jesse, and Mira returned on Wednesday for our two-day total point affair. This was a tight game between all three players throughout, but Deb took a slight lead heading into double jeopardy. Jesse dropped down to zero after missing a big, true daily double. They don't always go your way. While Deb and Mira steadily built on their scores, and it was Deb who took the lead heading into final. There, they were the only player correct, and with a big $8,000 wager, they took a commanding lead heading into day two with Jesse and Mira tied at 2800 Yeah, we, we uh, sometimes like to underplay the difference between first and, you know, second or third uh, after, you know, one day of a two-day final. This is not one to underplay. This is, you know, you need a, a big lead if you're Jesse or Mira to stay in this. Well, Ken caught up to the three finalists after this game. Let's take a listen to hear how they're feeling heading into day two. Congratulations, Deb. Came up with the correct final response. Thanks. Shout out to Tombstone, Kurt Russell. <laughs> is that true? Hollywood taught you about the OK Corral? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, you played a great game, but uh, you know that was a tough daily double. Were you, in fact, going back and forth between two responses? Yeah, and in hindsight, of course, like it's an animal. Go with the Galapagos. I did the same thing when I saw that clue. Sometimes that's just how it is. That made a big difference in the score, but again, you know, tomorrow there's going to be four chances for big wagers, three daily doubles and a final. Deb, how are you feeling with that lead heading into game two? Anything could happen. They're both great players, so I, I, I would expect nothing less than it will never be a cakewalk on the show, and especially not with these two. You may still have to play aggressively, even with a $19,000 lead nearly? <laughs> I definitely will. Okay. Yeah, well, best of luck to all three of you. We'll see what happens tomorrow. And moving on to Thursday, for day two of the finals, all three players pretty evenly matched at the end of the Jeopardy round. In double Jeopardy, Jesse put himself back in contention with the help of a big $7,400 daily double. You win some, you lose some. This one goes Jesse's way. Mira then found the final daily double. She also goes all in, but unfortunately could not come up with the correct response. Mira and Deb worked to build up their scores, but it was Jesse who took a commanding lead heading into final. In that round, he wagered almost everything, but it was a triple stumper in final, giving Deb the win and the final spot in the Tournament of Champions. Something came up in this game that people sometimes wonder about. The category was advertising slogans. The clue Capital One asks this forward question. Jesse responds, what's in your wallet? And sometimes people wonder, is that okay? Do what you have is, to add? Yeah, do you have to add what is what's in your wallet? Just a reminder to everyone at home, it is in the form of a question. So that counts. That works. I think it would be fun for the writers to do an entire category where the responses are questions. Do you think they haven't done it? I don't know. I feel like in 40 years they probably have. I love it. Already in the form of a question. I like it. And I'll then to yeah, we'll see... Talk. If the contestants add the what, add is, the what is or not, or not, that would be it good. Would give us something to talk about here on the pod. We can always use something else yeah. to talk about. So <laughs> I like it. Well, congratulations to Deb. They will return to the Alex Trebek stage next week to face off against Troy Meyer and Sean McShane. And later in the pod, Deb will be joining us. But right now, it's time to discuss the first of the Tournament of Champions quarterfinal matchups. Emily Sands, Suresh Krishnan, and Matthew Marcus. It was a slow start for our players, but Emily finished the Jeopardy round with the lead and really took off in double Jeopardy, finding the first daily double, betting big, skyrocketing her lead even further. Suresh then found the last daily double and also went all in, but he wasn't able to come up with the correct response and unfortunately did not make it to final. Emily, though, cruised into that round with a no-doubt runaway, becoming our first TOC semifinalist. This is our first TOC Champions wildcard contestant showing that 
you know, the the crop from these champion wildcard competitions is just as good as these great multi-game champions. Yes, and you have to love Emily's final Jeopardy response, knowing that she has a runaway. Who are the greatest people in the universe? Jeopardy fans. Emily has talked about, you know, just all the love and support she's received, not only from her fellow competitors, but also just from the Jeopardy community. We love to hear that. Another thing you might have noticed in this game... (laughs) Matthew Marcus. Yes. He looks a little bit different. Yes. Uh, Ken, a lot he, different. A lot different. Ken <laughs> joked, you know, when he went to take the picture, he's like, didn't you have facial hair last time? And Jimmy told everyone in the audience, Matthew got a haircut, everybody. I mean, it's a complete 180. He went from long hair to short hair, facial hair to no facial hair, no glasses to glasses. It's kind of a reverse Ray Lalonde where there's multiple people who look like Ray. Matthew looks like multiple people. Yes. I'm not convinced that Matthew Marcus doesn't have an identical twin and that this is actually his identical (laughs) twin competing. I do want to point out, Suresh had a very cool signature. I think maybe the night before being honors and seeing that uh, Ah. a multilingual name signature won, Suresh was inspired. And I believe this is Tomo? Yes. And in fact, we always do our research. (laughs) So uh, one of the members of the contestant team reached out and said, You know, he wants to do his name in Tamil. He's written it. Can someone please verify? And so Mm. our researchers then went and checked to see if the characters he had used indeed spelled Suresh in Tamil. It was close. Uh, There's, you know, different interpretations. But we felt like it was good to go. And Suresh, I'm certain you will be in the running for Best Signature next year. (laughs) Suresh joined his fellow competitors after the game. Let's take a listen to what they all had to say. Emily, congratulations. Thank you, Ken. Was it all a blur, or are you getting good at this by now? Oh, no, I don't think there's any getting used to this. It's <laughs> such a... <laughs> I feel good when I'm playing, but now, like, that we're not and in breaks, I'm shaking the whole time. But I, can, I can settle down when, when we're playing, so that's when it counts. Suresh, it was tough to say goodbye to you like that, but you made big wagers on two mm-hmm. daily doubles like you had to do against tough players. Yeah, I was like, you know, really the, the buzzer thing was like off a little bit. So I had to really take my chances. So whenever I had a chance, I had to go all in. I had to try. And it looks like you didn't watch a worn VHS copy of The Never Ending Story a hundred times in your childhood like I did. I, I, I had it here. Like it just didn't come out. Like, you know, it's my recall thing, you know, so. Matthew, you played well. You got some British content. You got some American content. We threw the American Revolution your way. Ah, uh, we don't talk about scary. the American Revolution, Ken. Still a sore subject. <laughs> well, when you make it on the Stephen Fry show, you two can roast America and the Revolution you to go. your heart's content. <laughs> Emily, how are you feeling about the semifinals? Ah, uh, still in a little bit of shock. I was fully prepared for this to be my last appearance on the Alex Trebek stage, and to keep going is just a dream. Well, that wraps up our game highlights. Now it's time for this week's host chat. An audience member asked Ken, what's your snack food of choice? Snack food of choice. I feel like white cheddar Cheez-Its are kind of the perfect food. And it breaks my heart. You know, when I think about how many hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people live without ever eating a a white cheddar Cheez-It. Lived and died without having a single one. Doesn't seem fair. Would you have guessed it? White I would cheddar not, cheese. I would not. I would not have guessed it. And yet, there's something so white cheddar cheese it about Ken. <laughs> do you have a favorite snack, Buzzy? I do. I eat a lot of cashews. Alexa, our podcast producer, just said boring. Well, you know, I'm like a fitness guy a little bit, so cashews are like a safe a safe bet. And you know, there are other nuts in rotation, but cashews are like always there, and I always kind of emphasize them. Got it. So disappointed in me everybody in this podcast so that's enough about me sarah do you have a favorite snack (laughs) well i do i like will you share it with us i will and carlos our other podcast producer does not approve because my favorite snack is mini peppers not cut up or anything oh yeah just dipped in hummus yeah i like that what's wrong with that carlos he can't he just does not understand how one would take a whole pepper it's a mini pepper yeah yeah i know dip it in hummus what's the pro does he want you to take like a bell pepper and slice it up and dip it is that what he would prefer it's not a snack, he it's says. It's not. It is very much a snack. It's a very much a snack, and it it's is it. delicious. And Carlos and maybe Alexa are missing out on cashews and hummus. Yeah. And no, Alexa does love hummus and peppers. But I think she's she missing like out cashews. on cashews, <laughs> and Carlos is missing out on other snacks. You know what? So. You and I will be eating healthy, and Alexa and Carlos and Ken will be eating their white cheddar Cheez-Its, and we will be here fit, ready to compete on the Amazing Race together. 
All right, switching gears just a bit. It is now time to welcome to the pod our final Champions Wildcard winner, Deb Bilodeau. Deb, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, we're catching up with you just days after your thrilling final has aired, and obviously you're now in the throes of the Tournament of Champions. Tell us how it's been for you in recent weeks. Oh, boy. Um, I've kind of felt like a secret agent or something, like, (laughs) you know, trying to preserve my cover uh, a little bit, you know, trying to be on the down low. So it's been a it's been quite a crazy experience just to go right from Champions Wildcard to the Tournament of Champions. Never really expected to be here, but it's been a lot of fun. Well, and one thing that our listeners wouldn't know is that on the promo day for the Tournament of Champions, your finals hadn't aired yet, so we couldn't include you in some of the promotional material because we would have a spoiler. So we had that photo shoot with all 27, and we'd be like, come on in, Deb. Okay, you can be in this one. Okay, Deb, now go on out. That was, yeah, go away. You know, that's no, never oh, happened Deb, before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, people were joking about uh, that I should be like, you know, photoshopped in as like a silhouette with a big question mark, you know, like a mystery, <laughs> mystery date. Vibe. Yes. <laughs> Tell me what it has been yeah. like to just be a part. You know, first you came off of a group of 27 for Champions, Champions Wildcard Wild Card. and then coming into mm-hmm. another group of 27 for Tournament of Champions. That's 53 new best buddies, right? A lot of new best buddies and a lot of people who were previously just talking heads on my TV who now are real people. A lot of people have made the comparison to um, like a summer camp. Mm. And it's definitely kind of kind of felt like that. A little bit of like a jury sequestration situation maybe for (laughs) Tournament of Champions just because it's like, oh, my God, a little slightly more pressurized. I've never been in a room where I'm not necessarily like the biggest nerd. I think generally like. You know, out of my friends, I'm the like person who's going to come up with the random facts, and a lot of these people really, really wound me. But it's been really great, yeah, hanging out at the hotel with everyone, and I don't know, just kind of getting to know all these people with all these kind of diverse life experiences. People who are really into quizzing, or like people who like a lot of you know accomplished lawyers and all this stuff. It's really yeah. cool. So Deb, you came in a one day champion to the Champions Wild Card. Did mm-hmm. you feel like, yeah, had you prepared differently? How did you feel like you stacked up or you sizing up the competition? In terms of like prep for wildcard, thankfully I hadn't gotten rid of my like study notebooks. So I was just kind of like able to build off that a bit. I had thrown away my maps, so I had to redraw some maps. <laughs> but in terms of like sizing other people up, for me the game, the the head game is kind of with myself. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm kind of my, like, not really opponent, but kind of I'm playing against myself, if that makes sense. Or it's like, Mm -hmm. I'm the person buzzing in and I, you know, Mm -hmm. I need not get psyched out. Yeah. And you had a pretty exciting come from behind win in the quarterfinals. Going from that come from behind win into the semis, were you feeling like, oh, I kind of like skated by or were you just like in it ready to go? I definitely felt like I at the same time got lucky and then also kind of in a redemptive turn made a very like savvy wager so yeah. i didn't really feel like i got like it was pure happenstance because no how absolutely I, not how i lost my my second game was just like over wagering so i definitely felt like a lot of redemption and i was just like well i didn't really expect to make it past the quarterfinals so i was mm. just kind of like there to see what happens and and have fun Well, and heading into the semis then, you are all correct in final. You have a big wager, and you just kind of get to put an exclamation point on that win. It was after (laughs) that game, I think, where I learned something interesting, and that is the fact that you had lost your glasses and that (laughs) people on the Internet were going to think that, you know, you weren't really enjoying yourself, but it was really that you were squinting (laughs) trying to see the game board. That is the fact that you pulled off the win with that going on in Champions Wildcard is even more impressive. (laughs) Yeah, thankfully, my prescription isn't too strong. So, I mean, definitely can see myself, you know, now that I've had a viewing party or two, I (laughs) I can see myself really like squinting at the board and people like must think I have some kind of like hockey game face going on where I'm like trying to be really intimidating, but I'm really just trying to make sure that the text is kind of in focus. And you also commented in that post game chat that you felt like the internet people that they are saying, you know, it doesn't seem like Deb likes the game, but you said, I love this game. I grew up watching it. I love this game. Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, I think maybe part of part of it is that 
I mean, everyone's a little bit nervous and that manifests in different ways. And maybe I'm just like kind of trying to keep myself very calm and level because I'm kind of a wacky, wacky person, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I'm just trying to be very like chill and keep myself together. And maybe that's how it comes off. My mom loves to joke that Wheel of Fortune is what taught me how to read. Um, but I've been watching Jeopardy like as long as I can remember. So it was like always a dream, even when I was like a little kid to go on the show especially like you know when Alex was hosting so it's so funny that like it doesn't seem like I'm having fun because I'm really having a blast I guess mm. I'm also just concentrating and yeah yeah you know, literally trying to focus and now a quick word from our sponsor selling a little or a lot Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point of sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Plus, they have the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. What I love about Shopify is how simple they've made it to grow your business. You can manage inventory, track payments, and view real-time insights all in one place. Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash jeopardy. One in five Americans have learned a new language on their bucket list. And if that's you, make 2024 the year you finally check it off the list with Babbel. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Their conversation-based technique teaches you useful words and phrases to get you speaking quickly about things you actually talk about in the real world in as little as three weeks. Babbel's helped me learn everything I need to have real-world conversations, from vocabulary words to culture. Plus, it only takes 10 minutes a day, so I'm able to fit in a session even when I'm on the go. All of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day Money back guarantee. Here is a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 50% off a one time payment for a lifetime Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash inside J. Get 50% off at babbel.com slash inside J, spelled B A B B E L dot com slash inside J. Rules and restrictions may apply. Now, back to Inside Jeopardy. Well, tell us about your Jeopardy journey. When did you decide to start trying out? How long did it take? What was your experience like? I think I took the online test maybe for the first time in like 2018. And then I think I had a an in-person audition um, sometime in 2018. I mean, I think it was in the pool for a while. Um, I moved to the East Coast and started like farming. And I think I got a call in 2020 that they wanted me for the show but I think that was like when they were just starting to reopen they thought I was in the Bay Area because that's how I had auditioned but was not at the time. I guess I took the online test again and then I had a one-on-one -on -one Zoom audition with Jimmy. Um, ah. People are always like what? <laughs> I know this is um, I always tell this Jimmy and I you know during COVID everyone all hands in how can you help yeah. so we were doing contestant auditions yeah. Well and I remember actually I had no idea that it was going to be like with Jimmy um, and he like <laughs> popped up on my zoom screen and I kind of just start laughing because he's like a celebrity because he's the clue crew yeah um, he's like going to the Galapagos <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I was I think I was kind of like maybe giggling a lot during like he, he I remember him specifically asking like hey why are you laughing and I was just like ah because you're Jimmy <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you had moved east to work in farming we noticed even in your appearances on the show originally you were a winemaker from California now you are a restaurant yeah. server the stomping grapes you just you didn't want to have to do that anymore is that what happened <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean it's it's hard work. It's no it's no joke. I did a few seasons, few harvests in New York, both farming the grapes and making the wine. And it's really rewarding work in a lot of ways. It's um, I love being close to land and really tasting the fruit of my own labor. And I kind of just decided I wanted to be home and closer to my family and landed myself back in the Bay Area. <laughs> yeah, working in a restaurant. It's I really love my coworkers. They're really wonderful people. 
Well, that's what it's all about. I feel the same way with my Jeopardy coworkers. <laughs> so getting back to Champions Wild Card, you know, you come out of the finals day one. You have a big lead after, mm-hmm. you know, a huge wager in final. How are you feeling heading into day two? I'm not, I'm definitely not resting on any kind of laurels going into day two because both my competitors, Jesse and Mir, are really incredible Jeopardy players and anything really could happen. I'm, it's not, it's not like a secure, doesn't feel like a secure win. Still coming in fresh game, just trying to stay in there and keep, keep buzzing. Well, game two was a pretty evenly matched in the Jeopardy round. And then, you know, Jesse with that huge $7,400 daily double really got himself into a lead position, but then Mm -hmm. triple stumper in Mm. Final Jeopardy. The category, in case you don't remember, (laughs) on vacation in Italy. About 30 miles from Florence, a little hill gives this Tuscan town its name, familiar to American visitors. It's a triple stumper. What was going through your mind? I... It's funny because I've been to Italy. I think I was personally thrown by the outside of Florence, like the the like the the place setting aspects of that clue. I don't really know why I I didn't get there. Well, well it the didn't matter. News, it <laughs> didn't matter. Yeah, yeah, the good news is it didn't matter. And I think in addition to your joyful reaction to winning in the post game chat, you said. Well, now I have to get off more time from work without telling anyone <laughs> why. Like, that was what was going through your mind in your winning moment. I got to come back for a whole week and do the Tournament of Champions. Oh, God. Another uh, <laughs> all-expenses-paid vacation. I think it's also just... I know. I, I was talking, actually, to, to Juveria about this. She's a really she's a really wonderful person. And I was saying, I was like, it's weird that I was just thinking immediately about the stressful things when I won. And I mean... You could do a lot of Mm. um, like armchair psychology about that. But I think it was more just something that I couldn't believe was happening to me. And I really like seized upon what felt real. And what felt real is, oh, God, I have to get time off now. So what did you tell your job? I have to know. (laughs) Where where have you been? (laughs) Um, I know. I think some some people kind of figured it out. But um, (laughs) thankfully, I have a really sweet and kind manager. And I told her, hey, I need these days off. And I I won, but I can't tell anyone. Um, Can you help me out? (laughs) And she she just kind of made me disappear. So. There you go. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of eateries and Jeopardy, uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you know my hard hitting question, which is, what is your Sony commissary lunch order? Ooh, that's tough. Well, I feel like on if I'm if I'm playing after mm-hmm. lunch, which has been the case a couple times, it's a sliced pepperoni pizza, just because. Um, no matter my nerves or my nausea levels, I can I can kind of get that down and definitely like have some have some fuel, have some protein. When I'm not playing, I finally got to have the bulgogi beef rice bowl. Oh yeah, mm. that hit. That was like a really great, like very balanced meal. I got some vegetables, I got some savory savory protein, some rice. Nice. That was that one hit the spot for nice. sure. No spoilers about what comes next. Obviously, you're back for the TOC, and we'll be talking about mm-hmm. those games on future pods but coming out of the champions wild card like what's a what's a aspect of your play or a stat or something that you feel like really proud of oh you know it's funny because i i really wasn't aware of the box scores in my original run so like i didn't actually see my stat um <laughs> when i first was on i think maybe i kind of found out about them um jesse chin made baseball a baseball card of himself and he had all his stats. I was like, how'd you get all your stats? Um, <laughs> I love and this. so, yeah, I was able to like look on the internet. So in terms of like, you know, not, you're not a stat not head. My, That's okay. Yeah. I'm not, not so much a stat head. I wish I, I wish I were a little more, but I mean, I, I think when I finally like got to see my core score on, on J archive and I was like, Oh my God, this is real. Uh, yeah. That felt pretty good. Yeah. I, one, one thing is for me, the, the buzzer has always been, kind of like elusive i mean obviously i did a little bit of training in terms of just like standing in front of my tv with the with the little jeopardy home game button so i was happy of how much i managed to like Mm. make make that training regimen work but i don't know an aspect of my game i feel proud of that's a nice question i mean i'm i'm proud of how i like nose to the grindstone was able to improve on subjects like like geography or like kind of the more like hard academic subjects that mm-hmm. I was able to be like, oh, I really like internalized Tanganyika, which I had not something I had really 
thought about that much as a like more casual Jeopardy mm-hmm. um, viewer, but that I was able to like retain those kinds of things. Yeah. I really love to learn, and sometimes it's hard for me to to, to to study like kind of pure road or pure memorization. And the things that I'm really happy that I got from my Jeopardy experience um, are are those kinds of like little nuggets of knowledge that like I will still stay with me after the fact. I love it. Well, and you talked about the baseball cards. You know, we have made digital baseball cards with your stats for the TOC. <laughs> so, Jesse, watch out. Deb's going to have one now, too. I know. I'm curious to see what my signature is on that one. <laughs> you talk about the signature, and I have to ask about this, because your penmanship has gone... Everyone on Reddit is talking about it. How do you write? I have used the stylus, as have you, Jesse. Yeah, impossible. I don't know how you write your letters so perfectly, equally in size, totally balanced across. How do you do it? Well, I have to find some way to put my art degree to work doing Jeopardy. So I guess that's that's it. I have a background in drawing, so I guess I'm just able to control the thing. Well, I think also like a Wacom pen now and maybe different from like old the tethered one. Because I feel like on my first time it was like a tethered pen like in the bank. It only became Um, untethered at the start of the season. Yeah. It's definitely changed uh, the signature thing. But since I found out about best signature at Jeopardy Honors, Watch out. Hopefully, Watch hopefully I've been out, running. Yeah. Young Shen. <laughs> Deb is coming for you. Well, what's next for Deb Bilodeau, hot off the Tournament of Champions? Oh, I don't know. Um, some rest, really, <laughs> honestly. I'm just surfing on good vibes for right now. We love your good vibes. Thank you so much for joining us in the pod. Congratulations on just a really great run here in recent weeks. It's been so much fun to watch you compete. All right, that brings us to the end of today's show. We will be back next week for more TOC game highlights. You're not going to want to miss those because a lot happens this week in the TOC. Plus, we're going to be talking with co-head writers Billy Weiss and Michelle Loud about exactly what goes into the writing process for the Tournament of Champions. Can't wait, and we will see you all next week. See you then.
For more great Jeopardy videos, hit the subscribe button below.